National Park Service and uh, Mike Bell with the National Park Service. Um, we're about to start the NADP TDEP seminar series. Please let us know if you're having any issues with the webinar, but it looks like everything is, is up and running. So we wanted to do this um, series on the TDEP white paper that came out recently um, to do some outreach to a bigger and broader audience. Uh, the white paper was on the science needs for continued development of nitrogen deposition budgets in the U.S. Um, as many of you know, it was an extensive effort by many agencies, universities, and other partners. Mike, do you want to forward the slide? The effort was led by John Walker of EPA, Office of Research and Development, and Greg Beachley, EPA, Office of um, Air. Um, the effort resulted in a 400-page white paper that is currently available on the NADP website. It also resulted in four um, articles in AMA's magazine for environmental managers. The issue came out in July of 2019. And we just heard this morning that we will be able to put the entire issue along with the other four articles um, on the NADP website and send folks there so you're able to access those. There are also seven articles that came out in Science of the Total Environment, and we're waiting to hear from them on the best way to distribute those articles. Um, we had originally planned for this uh, seminar to take the place of the CLAD Working Group 4 um, time on the third Tuesday of each month, but we heard from a few site operators that Tuesday is just not the best day for um, a seminar about deposition. So we're going to go ahead and keep this on Wednesdays moving forward. So it'll be the third Wednesday of the month um, at noon mountain time um, with two presentations each month. And um, I foresee that this will probably go through summer of 2020. Um, I will mention that we are recording this, um, and I will work with the NADP program office to get these recordings put on the NADP TDEP website, and we will send you a link um, on where to access those. So the next slide, Mike. So this is the working schedule, I would say. Um, today, we're going to hear from uh, John Walker about measurements on air surface exchange and from uh, Greg Weatherby and Pam Tepler on uh, total atmospheric nitrogen deposition in urban areas. Um, we have our speakers um, lined up for October. October 16th, Mike Bell will be talking about advancing throughfall methods, and Selma Issel will be talking about occult deposition. I want to thank them for volunteering to give their presentations in October since it's a couple weeks before the fall NADP meeting, and I, I know we're all busy at that time. So um, today, uh, the talk on urban deposition is actually going to go first. So with that, let me introduce Pam Templer. And Mike, you can uh, switch to her computer as we're doing that. So Pam is faculty at Boston University in the Department of Biology. She's the Director of Biogeoscience and Urban Graduation Program. Her lab focuses on effects of air pollution and climate change on forested ecosystems. And she's also interested in sources and effects of atmospheric deposition in both urban and rural environments. And Pam, you should be able to uh, share your screen now. Great. Can you guys see that when I move from one slide to the next? No, it's not sh sharing yet. Okay. Should I be doing that? Oh, I see. Let's see. Do you see it now? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. And when I advance it, do you see that? Yep. We should do. One Good to go. And okay. Mike, we're going to set folks on mute. Yeah, and everyone's going to be on mute during the presentation, and then afterwards we'll unmute so everyone can ask questions. If you have anything, feel free to enter it into the chat box as well, and I can read it off um, after the talk. Okay. 
It's all you, Pam. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for the introduction, and it's nice to be with all of you today. Um, we all agreed at the start we'll have questions at the end of the presentations, but if any of you have a burning question, I guess right into the chat box and, and we'll try to pause. So today I'm going to talk with you about patterns and controls on atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon in urban environments. I'm going to mostly focus on nitrogen, but I'll touch a little bit on phosphorus and carbon as well. And so many of you, I'm sure, know on this call that we're doing a lot to alter the nitrogen cycle. There's been a huge amount of attention on the fact that we increase nitrogen emissions to the atmosphere through burning of fossil fuels at electrical power plants, driving of our cars, as well as activities associated with agriculture, like the production and use of synthetic fertilizers and leguminous crops. And so for decades, we were focused on this end of the spectrum of how are we elevating rates of nitrogen emissions to the atmosphere. And a lot of that was um, concerns about what happens to that nitrogen when it goes to the atmosphere. Some of it stays there. We end up with NOx, tropospheric ozone, but also relevant to this group, of course, is that when we increase rates of emissions of nitrogen, that elevates rates of nitrogen deposition. At first, that's a great thing. It fertilizes our ecosystems. They grow more. Um, but of course, there's a concern with nitrogen saturation that we can have too much of a good thing. And so some of the many environmental concerns with elevated nitrogen is the idea of increased runoff into nearby waterways that's associated with the release of nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas, reduced productivity, acidification of stream water, algal blooms, and with human health, blue baby syndrome. And so, of course, thanks to all of you on this call and millions of other people, we have the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. So I'm just showing you the standard map. In this case, it's annual rates of wet nitrogen deposition. Um, as you all know, most of these sites are primarily in rural areas. Um, and as a result of long-term measurements of nitrogen deposition in rural areas, we know that we saw a really big increase up through the late 80s. And then with the Clean Air Act amendments, we've since seen a decline in nitrogen deposition, especially in the form of nitrate. Um, and so this decline has actually shifted the conversation from one of a concern about saturation to one about oligotrophication. And the idea being that while we used to have tons of nitrogen floating in the environment, we now are seeing other factors increase demand for nitrogen by vegetation, such as increased warming temperatures, longer growing seasons, elevated CO2. And so it might be that as we're declining rates of nitrogen deposition and increasing demand by vegetation, we might see a situation where we're incurring even more nitrogen limitation to our natural ecosystems. So we've seen evidence for this phenomena at um, Hubbard Brook, which is where this top paper comes from. In a, a meta-analysis of sites around the globe, we also see isotopic evidence for this idea that nitrogen is becoming more and more limiting to biota around the globe. And this has made headlines with this one is an example, availability of nitrogen to plants is declining as the climate warms. And so a lot of the conversation right now in the literature is about this shift from saturation in some areas to nitrogen limitation or oligotrophication in others. But I'd argue that much of that conversation is happening in rural ecosystems, not everywhere. We certainly see elevated rates of deposition in rural areas in places, but a lot of the conversation in the literature is shifting to this idea of oligotrophication. Um, but we know from many studies, not just our own, that deposition can be elevated in urban areas. So for those of you who don't work in cities, you might wonder why would we go there? Why would we study this? Um, this is a photograph on the bottom of our campus, the Boston University campus. To the left there is the Charles River and, and straight ahead is, is downtown Boston. And the reason we focus on nitrogen deposition in urban systems is that even though these areas are relatively small, they make up the majority of NOx emissions to the atmosphere. We know that most of our population live in cities and we simply lack studies of nitrogen biogeochemistry in urban areas. Now, there have been many studies that have taken into account urbanization. We traditionally had the urban-rural, you know, um, just a dichotomy. So people set up collectors in rural areas and urban areas. Um, the graph on the right is from our own study looking at a rural to urban gradient from Boston to Harvard Forest, which is in Central Mass, in both cases documenting higher rates of nitrogen deposition in cities. But one thing we've been more and more interested in is not just seeing that cities are elevated in terms of deposition, but what's controlling the variation in deposition in cities themselves. And so in 2015 and 16, we set up the first NADP sites in Boston. Um, we didn't have, we had a rural NADP site not too far away, but no urban sites here. 
Um, that's MA22 and MA98. So the one at, um, on the upper left of your screen is at the Arnold Arboretum, and the one on the bottom right is on a rooftop at Boston University. And so because, as all of you know, it's not feasible to set up multiple NADP sites across an entire city because that's expensive, we compared our NADP data to those data that we got from ion exchange resin collectors that were paired with them. So in this bottom left screen, you can see a PVC pipe with a funnel on the top, but what you can't see is inside that PVC pipe is an ion exchange resin collector that we use, um, and you can see a photograph of it to the left, where you can measure ammonium nitrate or any other ion that's falling um, from the sky. And so just to show you that using ion exchange resin collectors is a great way to have a proxy if you wanted to scale up and have many sites in a study. Um, these are data where the gray dots in each of the figures represent the cumulative amount of inorganic nitrogen from our NADP sites. The top one is total inorganic, then nitrate, then ammonium at the bottom. The black squares represent the nitrogen that accumulated in our ion exchange resin columns at the same site. And so the upper, the uppermost figure, you can see that we got relatively good agreement between the cumulative amount of total inorganic nitrogen um, between the NADP collectors and the ion exchange collectors. Um, slightly different results when we compared nitrate. Um, it seems that for some reason, we don't know why, that ion exchange resin columns overestimate nitrate compared to NADP, but underestimate ammonia. So there's generally good agreement, but just some caveats to keep in mind. Um, but when you look at the top figure, we do get good agreement when we're looking at total inorganic rates. So here I'm going to share with you some data we have from Boston. Those of you not right here in New England, Boston's in the northeastern United States. Um, we're right in Massachusetts along the coast, and, and we're in New England. Um, these data I'm going to share with you were collected by Steve Dechina, who I know some of you know. He was a former PhD student who graduated from our group. Um, he set up 15 sites across the greater Boston area. He put three collectors, ion exchange resin collectors, in each of the sites, all below the canopy. So this is through fall um, because it's difficult in a temperate region like ours to get sites that are all out in the open. So to keep it consistent, he had the same tree species um, assemblages and, and put all these collectors um, beneath the canopy. These are data from a former publication. Um, as I mentioned before, we have this urban to rural gradient. Um, so what I'm showing you here is total nitrogen deposition on the y-axis, and on the left side at the bottom is the central Boston site, and all the way to the right is central Massachusetts at Harvard Forest. Again, not surprising, we see higher rates of deposition in the urban areas. What surprised us though was the amount of variability we found in the greater Boston area. So I've added the black triangles here to represent the 15 sites where Steve put his collectors. And one thing to draw your attention to is that when I bracket the variation or the range of values across the 15 urban sites, they span almost all of the variation we saw across the urban to rural gradient. But when we look at all the urban sites as a whole, they're still elevated relative to our rural sites. So these are the, this is um, an aerial photograph of the greater Boston area, and each of these dots represents an individual site. The legend is just the redder the color, the higher the rates of deposition, and the, the bluer the color, the lower rates. We don't see any, you know, very predictable trends in or patterns of deposition across the greater Boston area. Um, we do, again, find higher rates, and in this case, about five times higher rates of deposition in the greater Boston area compared to rural areas of central Massachusetts. But as you can see here, they vary quite a bit, and um, in total, they vary between three and four fold. So that, of course, begs the question, what is controlling variability of total deposition in cities? And so what I'm going to do first is just show you a figure with NOx emissions from tailpipe emissions on the x-axis and nitrate deposition, and then I'll show you ammonia and ammonium. Um, I'm showing you two sets of data here. One in the white circles is our urban rural gradient all the way from Boston to Central Mass. The black triangles represent just the urban sites, and you can see they overlay with each other pretty well, such that sites that have relatively higher emissions of NOx from tailpipes of cars um, are correlated pretty strongly with local rates of nitrate deposition. So suggesting, at least in Boston, that a lot of the variability in nitrate deposition is controlled by local sources. Here I'm showing you ammonia emissions from tailpipes on the x-axis and ammonium deposition on the y-axis. We get a, a small split between in slope between the whole gradient and just the greater Boston sites. But in both cases, we see this positive relationship where localized emissions of ammonia 
are strongly correlated with local deposition of ammonium, suggesting that in Boston and probably many other cities, we're not just seeing the prevailing winds bringing in atmospheric deposition, but localized sources as well, but cars are not the only source. Um, so here what I'm showing you is just ammonium deposition across the four time periods that we measured it um, in the through fall, and this is ammonium on the y-axis, and we broke this up by spring, summer, fall on the x-axis. And just to draw your attention, you can see we found significantly greater rates of ammonium deposition in the springtime compared to summer and fall. We think some of this is likely because, at least in New England, you suddenly see tons of gardening going on as the, the big winter ends in, in April and May. Um, you could start to smell all the manure people are putting out the mulch, um, but we think perhaps some of this elevated ammonium might be ammonia volatilized from localized um, application of ammonium fertilizer and maybe local deposition. We also think some of this is likely due to simply biogenic fluxes within the canopy itself. We see tons of frass and insect activity and pollen um, in the early springtime, and so that is something we want to pull apart in the future as well. And so we then took these data and scaled them up to the greater Boston area. Um, our city here in Boston is covered by about 25% canopy cover. And we find that with nitrogen, if you compare canopy rates or through fall of deposition compared to bulk inputs, it doubles those rates of nitrogen deposition. And for phosphorus, it triples it. So basically the tree canopy across the city of Boston, where we have tree canopy, appears to amplify the inputs of nutrients um, to the fourth floor, or in many cases, just to the ground. And so when we think about this, a traditional biogeochemical cycle would suggest that nutrients come from the sky, either in the form of bulk or, or through fall deposition. Um, and some of those elements are cycled through plants and microbes and other organisms. And that arrow going to the water is relatively small compared to what I'm going to show you to indicate that we tend to get tight coupling of nutrients in intact ecosystems. However, in a place like Boston or other cities where much of the ground is covered by cement, it's very possible that in those areas where we have tree canopies amplifying atmospheric deposition, we might actually see increasing amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and other elements moving into our nearby waterways. So a big unknown that we're working on right now is the question of how do vegetation and soils interact in Boston and other urban areas to either retain or lose nitrogen or phosphorus to nearby waterways and back to the atmosphere. And so just to end with a couple, some conclusions, I have two slides here. Um, what I've shown you today is that atmospheric deposition in cities, um, especially Boston, is high and spatially variable. It's correlated with vehicle emissions of both ammonia and NOx. It's amplified by the tree canopy with implications for water and air quality. And I bring this up because Boston, like many other cities across the world, are really trying to increase canopy cover to deal and mitigate with climate change. And so I think it's important to understand how planting more trees, having more canopy cover, perhaps amplifying through fall or at least concentrating it in some areas of cities is important for looking at biogeochemical cycling of the different elements in question. And so where do we go from here? Um, I know Greg is going to talk about this as well, um, is we really need to create more sites within the NADP and accompanying measurements such as ion exchange resin columns and other methods um, so that we can gather more information across cities to see if patterns in Boston and Denver and elsewhere are held up. Um, we've created the city depth network. So if any of you on the call are interested in adding new measurements um, to this network and coming together as a group to figure out and think and brainstorm new ideas for the future of urban deposition, we absolutely welcome your participation. Um, I think also a next step is we need to understand the interactions between nitrogen deposition with other pollutants, land cover, and climate so that we can understand these all in an integrated system. And I just want to thank my many people who helped make this work possible as well as our funding sources. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now, or maybe we should wait, let Greg do his talk, and we could both answer questions after. However you'd like to do it is fine with me. But thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. There was one question that popped up. Um, Doug, did you want to speak up, or I think I unmuted oh, everybody. If not, I see Doug's question in the chat box. Okay, yeah. So the question was, what distance from nitrogen deposition collectors was used for emissions? Great question. So what we did is we used the, the location of the three collectors that were all close to each other, but at least one meter apart from each other. And we basically 
set, made that the center of a grid, and then each grid was um, 500 meters on a side. Since you have your presentation up, if I think it probably makes sense, just in case anyone has questions directly related to it, to take them now. Are there any other questions? Just, just a comment, I guess, uh, in that this, I think this is the third time I've seen this presentation. It gets better every time. So. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> I've tried to add to it, but thank you. I have a question. And I should say, for, Oh, is there a question or? Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but this oh, is no Anita with the Forest Service. And I was very curious about your comment about forests um, increasing the rate of nitrogen deposition, if I understood your, mm -hmm. your point. And mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to that just a little bit more, what you think the mechanism behind that is? I was just just on a conference call um, before this one where they emphasized the decrease in or the improvement in air quality where you have more trees. So this is mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a um, you know an interesting twist on that. Yes, and, and that's a great question because I think there's so many different aspects to it. So on one hand trees directly biologically can take up um, compounds such as NOx, um, such as ozone, other things that can either, so if they're taking up the ozone, that will improve water, I'm sorry, air quality. If they're emitting volatile organic compounds, they're going to lead to um, poor air quality. So in terms of trees directly, that, that can, in some places, trees actually improve air quality, sometimes they don't. Here in terms of deposition, what I think is happening is they're just acting as great surfaces. And so, um, what happens is you have particulates that are in the air, aerosols, those might just settle onto leaves, and then as it rains, those get washed off. So some people consider through fall to be a great proxy for total deposition in terms of both wet and dry. So when you're putting a collector out in the open, you're getting, in a sense, bulk deposition um, if you don't have a wet collector that closes when it's not raining. Um, and then you put it under the tree, now you're really getting dry deposition that you might not get in your collector. So I think that's one thing. And then I think the other factor is biology in the canopy itself. So not just the plant surfaces, but perhaps insects that are there, um, pollen, the grains that get out. Um, I didn't mention this, but we found a significant amount of both organic phosphorus and nitrogen in our collectors as well. So is that coming straight from the canopy or is that coming from the atmosphere falling on the canopy and then coming down? That's something we're still working on. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Pam? You're not hearing any. Okay, thank you, Pam. We'll go ahead and move on to Greg's portion of the presentation. Greg Weatherby works for the USGS Water Resources. Um, he's in charge of the NADP External QA Program and he is also currently Secretary of NADP. Okay. And I couldn't we see got Pam's slides at first, and so I clicked on some things, and... We see your slides. You do? I do. Okay. <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. So just, so just, so just, uh, you know, get the Zen effect and stare at that for a little bit while, you know, I get this going. So I don't know how to advance this, but did I just advance it? Yep. That's it. Okay, great. So the first uh, slide that you got to look at, um, uh, we're starting with a photo of the NADP site, um, Colorado 86 at uh, the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. You might not consider that a uh, site to be urban in character, but per NADP siting criteria, it definitely is urban because uh, it's within 15 kilometers of a population density of 400 people per square kilometer. That's the NADP siting criteria. Um, now, this site that you're looking at definitely looks urban. How many presentations you get to see a bar in, shown in, in one of the slides? So, um, this is Colorado 06 in downtown Denver. It's located atop the Colorado Air Monitoring Platform. 
a one-story building um, surrounded by skyscrapers. Um, uh, this ur urban sites oftentimes uh, must be located atop buildings or platforms or behind fences to prevent vandalism. Um, this can have an effect on the representativeness of the collected samples, but it's rarely avoidable in an urban environment. Um, and I just wanted to sh show you what uh, an urban site uh, looks like um, in Denver. Um, this map is a map of my study area in the Denver Boulder Urban Corridor and Colorado Front Range. Uh, this is the Network for Urban Atmospheric Nitrogen Chemistry. And these are National Trends Network sites that are located along a southwest to northwest, uh, southeast to northwest trending transect that encompasses urban sites uh, in the east and rural sites in the mountains to the west. Um, one of the objectives of this ongoing study is to determine how much of the urban air pollution affects wet deposition of reactive nitrogen um, in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is monitored at Colorado 98 uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the map. So we'll be uh, looking at both um, some source um, term information here as well as just uh, just some you know urban characteristics. Um, so here are some scatter plots of NADP weekly precipitation chemistry data for the Nuance sites in 2017 um, and the rural montane sites. Uh, you can see that there are some chemical characteristics that are distinct for the urban sites. Um, correlation of calcium ion and pH is evident for both the urban and rural sites, but there is more variability in the urban data. That's um, commonly called the urban scrubber effect um, that uh, that has been described by um, by others. Um, and uh, the slope of the relations uh, are indeed different for each group of the sites. And the correlation of reactive nitrogen and pH is also different for urban versus rural sites in the transect. So the message here is that urban deposition chemistry is different um, in rural and, and montane areas within this study area, which is only about a uh, 50 mile long uh, transect. Um, this map of Colorado uh, shows that there is a gradient in uh, annual inorganic nitrogen concentrations along the, the nuance transect where the sizes of the red circles denote relative concentrations. So we'll be talking about this uh, this urban to rural gradient, which was something that, that Pam pointed out in, in her data as well. So here you can see a decreasing trend in median weekly inorganic nitrogen concentrations. That's the uh, thick dark line within each box is the median. Um, and that this is along the east to west transect of the sites where concentrations are generally higher in the urbanized areas, as you might expect. And looking at annual loads for each site along the transect reveals that nitrate loads are higher for the rural montane sites, but ammonium and total reactive nitrogen loads are higher for the urban sites. Uh, but loads for calcium and sulfate uh, are similar along the transect. So this is just another illustration of the uh, nitrogen deposition gradient um, for for 2017, and, uh, and and it's quite different from the uh, deposition gradient for there is no really a uh, deposition gradient for for some of the other constituents, but we we do see it for the nitrogen. Uh, let's see. So the message here is that there is a spatial gradient uh, of ammonia pollution, um, which is sampled as ammonium uh, in the wet deposition. The, the fraction of inorganic nitrogen attributed to ammonium is up to 80% in the uh, urban corridor, but decreases to about 60% in the high montane sites. Here's another scatter plot showing that the montane concentrations are tightly grouped at the low end of the concentration range, and there's certainly more variability in the urban site data. And again, that's, that's what Pam saw in her data, a lot of variability in the urban area. As I mentioned, there is an east to west gradient in ammonia pollution. And here are data from Katie Benedict at Colorado State University um, on, on the top graph, where the ambient ammonia concentrations in the agricultural area northeast of Denver, represented by the Kersey sites, is about 15 times that of the Denver urban concentrations. And ammonia concentrations in Rocky Mountain National Park are about 80% lower than in the urban corridor. And so there's this gradient. Uh, in, in the ambient ammonia um, that, that was sampled. Uh, the bottom graph shows the range of weekly wet deposited reactive nitrogen in gray 
compared to the montane sites in blue and black, which can be similar to the urban amounts for some events, but generally are lower than the urban weekly deposition amounts. So I mentioned we were trying to look at source terms and where this nitrogen might be coming from in the park. And um, using the NOAA high split model, we determined back trajectories for each sample. You can see that in the urban part of the transect, um, shown here, that the total reactive nitrogen concentrations are typically highest when the air mass back trajectories indicate sources from the north and east, which is where the agricultural sector is located, but there are also industrial and power generation emissions to the north of Denver. The second set of trajectories is for the sites located in Boulder and the mountains, and you can see that there is a more westerly contribution of reactive nitrogen and precipitation at these sites compared to the eastern uh, sites in the transect. Uh, in fact, very few back trajectories indicated sources of nitrogen from the east for the Colorado 98 site in Rocky Mountain National Park. So that, that, um, that site in the park is very uh, different and distinct from, from the urban areas, it, it seems, at least for 2017. So how can urban deposition data be used to improve annual deposition maps? Here's the 2017 TDEP map. This is both wet and dry deposition, adjusted for bidirectional flux and a whole host of other processes that I barely understand. Um, but you can see some urban areas here, like Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, and others um, that, are, 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 that kind of stand out. Um, but there's relatively low deposition shown for Denver. Here is the 2017 NDP wet deposition map where the urban areas are shown as dots that do not affect the spatial interpolation of the deposition grid. And here you can see the differences in the Denver site data as well as other urban areas. For example, check out the sites in Northwest New York. Um, the question is how would this map represent national deposition if the urban deposition was used in the interpolation? Well, here's a 2017 grid using only the regionally representative sites with no urban data from Denver, Arvada, and Boulder. Okay, now keep your eye on Denver. Here is the 2017 grid that includes the urban data. I hope you, you can see how the map shows more deposition in the Denver area, but it also has increased the interpolated deposition to the southwest of the city, which I find hard to believe uh, is representative of actual conditions. Um, we need more. Uh, spatial control both in uh, the mountains west of the city as well as uh, the east of the city. Here's a grid which is the difference between the maps with and without the urban data. And you can see that it would be helpful to add a site to the west of the city and perhaps to the east of the city to provide some control or at least verification of the radius of influence of the urban deposition. So we have more work to do with these data to develop an algorithm for appropriate inclusion of the urban data into NADP deposition maps. And in fact, um, it, it might be a, a topic of discussion as to how we might do that differently in the future instead of just plotting a dot. So one last thing I wanted to mention was uh, another thing um, that we monitor for is uh, stable isotopes of nitrogen and oxygen um, in the nitrate molecule. And there are gradients in the stable isotopes uh, evident from the samples collected across the transect. Um, we're continuing to collect data for um, uh, N15 and O18 in the nitrate to help tease out relative contributions of different emission sources and atmospheric processing of nitrogen in the regional air. Um, Dave Felix at Texas A&M also did some N15 uh, in the, the ambient ammonia analyses for us uh, in 2018. We're not ready to show those data yet, it's very interesting. I'll leave it at that. Um, but you can see in these uh, stable isotope um, plots, especially the, the one on the right, the plot on the right where we're showing um, oxygen 18 versus N15. Um, the arrows are pointing to points for uh, a confirmed upslope event where we went out and just sampled that one event. It's not a composite sample of multiple events. Those are, that's just a single event sample. And did you know you can do this with your NTN site? It's not, high, it's not widely advertised, but you can collect more samples. It's just you have to collect the one weekly sample. Um, so uh, probably people in Wisconsin are cringing right now. So anyway, um, 
you you can see that these uh, samples on the right side of the graph, those are all uh, in the mountains, and this, this samples on the left side of the graph, I'm talking about the, the ones with the arrows pointing to them, those are from the urban sites. And so um, we have some isotopic distinction um, in the urban corridor versus uh, in the mountains. And you can also kind of see um, how there's this gradient uh, on a site basis along the transect. Um, so you can look, look at these groups of, of, of points. It's hard to describe uh, without making a mess of the graph, but um, you can kind of see the uh, Colorado 06 and Colorado 87 uh, points toward the um, lower right and the montane sites, Colorado 98, uh, on, on the top. And so there's this gradient and isotopic composition of the nitrate um, throughout the urban corridor and up into the mountains. And we'll be looking at this um, for 2018 and 2019 and um, trying to make some sense of that in, in, a, in a separate paper um, coming up. So conclusions, uh, reactive inorganic nitrogen in the Denver Boulder Urban Corridor and adjacent front range is characterized by southeast to northwest concentration, deposition, speciation gradients, and also stable isotope gradients. And uh, urban white deposition data improved uh, the spatial representation of nitrogen loading to the front range region. However, it's not perfect. It's not correct. None of these interpolations are really uh, correct. They are models. And so, um, but I, I think that we can find ways to try to incorporate the uh, the urban data into these um, uh, products that, that we uh, prepare for the NADP data. And as Pam mentioned, there's not a lot of urban sites in the network. Um, just have about 12, I think, um, something like that. And um, you can see the distribution of the sites shown in red here. Those are those are the uh, urban sites in the network. Um, and as Pam mentioned, we have uh, the City Dep um, subcommittee, and we'd love to have more participation. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right. Well, I unmuted everyone. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask. And thanks, Greg. Sure. Someone just ask a question because I didn't quite hear that. I don't know that anybody did. It might have been some okay. background. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Greg and Pam. Appreciate you being our, our, our test case today. <laughs> Thanks for going first. You bet. Yeah, thank you. All right. From there, we will move on to... John Walker's talk. So John is with the EPA Office of Research and Development in Durham, North Carolina. He's done much of his research at Duke Forest, and he's currently the co-chair of TDEP and was a great leader for this effort. All right. Thank you, Christy. And just a heads up to everyone, because John signed in on the web, um, I had to make I actually I can I can I think I might be able to mute everybody else, but I, you might not be muted, so please just mute your own phones. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Can everyone see my slides? Yeah, we see them. All right, excellent. Well, um, I'll pick up with another topic from uh, my paper that Christy described earlier. The need to better understand dry deposition of reactive nitrogen is a theme that kind of cut across many of the topics in the white paper. And this first topic that I'll talk to you about today really is just one piece where we, we wanted to look at what data on dry deposition measurements are available and from when and where, and what do these available me measurements tell us about um, additional measurements that are needed to better understand dry deposition processes the contribution of dry deposition to total deposition and to improve dry deposition models. And so what I'm going to describe today is a review of measurements of air surface exchange in natural ecosystems across North America. Let's see if I can advance. Okay, there we go. 
So a little bit more on the motivation for this review. Uh, at the continental scale, dry deposition contributes more than half of total reactive nitrogen deposition. And this is, this is true um, if you develop budgets using different models and for different time periods. We know that dry deposition is, is important across the continental U.S. and in some areas much more important than others. But as you saw earlier, while we have extensive networks for wet deposition, we don't have networks that directly measure dry deposition and bidirectional air surface exchange. And due to this lack of measurements and a subsequent reliance on models for dry deposition estimates, dried up is much more uncertain than wet deposition. And in fact, field scale deposition models can differ by a factor of three or more for the more common inorganic nitrogen species, even when you're driving the model with the same um, micrometeorological and surface parameter uh, input. So we know that we need additional measurements of air surface exchange, and this is dry deposition and, and bidirectional exchange for, for North American ecosystems to improve deposition budgets and model algorithms. But as part of that, we need to assess the existing studies to inform what measurements are needed with respect to chemical species, ecosystems, geographic location, and processes. And so that motivates the, the work that I'll summarize for you today. So we performed a, a literature review of available flux studies. Uh, we looked at dry deposition and bidirectional exchange of reactive nitrogen, both gases and particles. And we organized the review and, and the results that you're going to see today in terms of inorganic oxidized nitrogen, inorganic reduced forms of nitrogen, including ammonia and ammonium aerosol, and organic nitrogen. We considered published North American studies. So this didn't include the wealth of information from European studies and, and studies elsewhere. We specifically wanted to see what data are available for North American ecosystems. And we, we looked only at natural ecosystems. We didn't consider flux studies that have been conducted in agricultural systems. And there are a number of those as well. So we just looked at this particular cross section of the literature. We also only considered micrometeorological flux measurement methods. So these are the non-invasive techniques um, that include eddy covariant, gradient flux measurement approaches, and hybrid approaches like relaxed eddy accumulation. So this doesn't discount the value of the data that were developed using inferential modeling approaches, which many of you are familiar with, or chamber techniques or, or other um, indirect approaches, but we specifically wanted to look at data sets that were developed using micromet approaches because these are the data sets that are most valuable for examining air surface exchange processes and improving models in addition to um, really quantifying with the best uh, accuracy we can dry deposition estimates. I'll quickly just talk about the methods for measuring fluxes because we'll come back to those. Um, eddy covariance is the most direct technique where you measure the concentration of the species of interest very rapidly up to 10 times per second and you correlate the fluctuating concentration directly with the fluctuating vertical wind speed. That's kind of the gold standard for flux measurements, but it requires a fast detector. So you have to measure the concentration of whatever you're interested in at more than once per second, typically up to 10 times per second. Gradient approaches relate the vertical concentration gradient to turbulence to quantify the flux and the relaxed eddy accumulation is a hybrid method for, and there are other hybrid micromet approaches as well. So we'll talk about the, the review in terms of the techniques that were used. We considered continuous flux measurements and flux measurements that were that employed time integrated chemical methods like filter packs or manual denuders. And we included both speciated flux measurements for individual compounds and bulk chemical methods. For example, uh, fast measurements of total NOI as a bulk flux measurement method. And we, and we looked at both of those categories. So to provide some perspective for the importance of dry deposition, and within the dry deposition budget, fraction of the budget, the relative importance of individual nitrogen compounds or groups of compounds, we developed a continental scale deposition budget for 2015 using version 5.2.1 of the CMAC model, which some of you are familiar with. 
an earlier version of CMAC is used for the Tdap maps that for some compounds in the Tdap maps that that Greg showed earlier. Um, so very quickly, the budget um, is separated on the left hand side in terms of total deposition, separated into wet deposition and and dry deposition. And the wet component includes total oxidized nitrogen, total wet deposition of reduced nitrogen, which is ammonia and ammonium, wet deposition of oxidized organic nitrogen, and other forms of nitrogen. And I'll just say that um, in terms of the organic nitrogen representation in CMAC, version 5.2.1 is an improvement over other versions in terms of the number of organic nitrogen compounds that are considered. And the models are continuing to evolve fairly rapidly there, but the organic part of the budget is, is, is limited still in terms of its representation in chemical transport models. And so it, it's underestimated in that respect. But if you look at the total deposition budget, about 61% is dry deposited for this time period and using this model, and 57% of it is an oxidized nitrogen form of some kind. So then if you look at the right-hand side, we'll split out just the deposition budget. And in this case, that includes dry deposition of nitric acid, dry deposition of nitrate aerosol, dry deposition of NOx, which is mostly NO2, um, dry deposition of peroxynitrates, that's total peroxynitrates in the gas phase, that's oxidized in pan T. Uh, oxidized organic N, which is other organic nitrates like isoprene nitrates and several others. And then other oxidized N, which includes N2O5 and HONO. Then reduced ammonia, dry deposition, this is estimated using a bidirectional framework for ammonia. And then finally, ammonium aerosol. And what you can see is that ammonia dry deposition and nitric acid dry deposition together account for about two thirds of the dry deposition budget. And then these other compounds or groups of compounds make smaller contributions and we will look at those in a little bit more detail as we work through the presentation. So here's kind of an overview of the, of the literature review showing the number of published studies for individual nitrogen compounds or groups of compounds. So again, this is published studies of direct measurements of air surface exchange in North American natural ecosystems as of about July 2019. And I've grouped the compounds here according to oxidized and reduced forms of inorganic nitrogen. And then on the right hand side in green, these are the organic nitrogen compounds. And then on the y axis, this is the number of published studies. And the take home message here is that kind of reinforces what we knew is that there just aren't a lot of studies where dry deposition or bidirectional exchange of reactive nitrogen has been measured directly. Uh, of the studies that do exist, nitric acid and ammonia have been the most widely studied of the inorganic nitrogen species. Uh, even those, this is not a large number of studies, but they've been studied the most extensively. But if you, if you shift over to the right-hand side and look at the organic nitrogen species, this, this really illustrates a lack of, of information and data pertaining to organic nitrogen. Peroxynitrates, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, have been the most widely studied, but, but even there, we only have a handful of studies, five studies. And then other, there have been, there's one study where several other organic nitrogen species have been measured directly in terms of, of quantifying air surface exchange. Now, to back up a little bit, there's a multitude of studies where concentrations of these different species have been measured. But we're talking specifically about studies where air surface exchange rates have been quantified directly. And what you can see is that we really lack information on organic nitrogen. For a number of these compounds, there's only been a single study. And then I'll point you to the far right hand side, and this is total reactive nitrogen dry deposition. And while there are some techniques for measuring this bulk flux that have been applied in Europe, we don't have any studies in the US where the total has been directly quantified. So this kind of sets the stage for the rest of the talk where we'll, we'll go into some of the studies of, for specific compounds or groups of compounds. So first looking at, at studies of nitric acid, um, if you think back to the, to the CMAC budget there, it was the most important species at the continental scale in terms of its contribution to total dry deposition, about 33.7%, 34%. Um, nitric acid is different from 
from most of the other compounds in that it deposits very rapidly, limited only by turbulent exchange, and it's assumed that there's no additional canopy resistance to nitric acid deposition. Um, we found 13 studies, some of them dating back to the mid-1980s. Um, some of the more recent studies are employing um, laser-induced fluorescence and chemical ionization mass spectrometry, spectrometry for eddy covariant flux measurements, where most of the earlier studies were gradient methods. Uh, there have been measurements over grassland, deciduous and coniferous forests, and even a study over lava rock at the Mauna Loa Observatory. So again, nitric acid has been the most widely studied of the nitrogen species in terms of fluxes. Um, but I'll point you to the right-hand side here. This is a Tdap map of the percent of total nitrogen as dry oxidized nitrogen for averaged over 2015 to 2017. And the red areas are those areas where dry oxidized nitrogen contributes a larger fraction of the total deposition budget. And you can see in, in the arid areas of the west and southwest, oxidized nitrogen, dry deposition in particular, makes a large contribution. And in these more arid areas where, where we see the larger contributions from oxidized nitrogen, which includes nitric acid, we don't have flux measurements. And so these are areas where dry deposition dominates the budget and we're lacking uh, flux measurements of nitric acid and, and other compounds in these areas. So that's an important geographical gap. And we need other studies to examine this assumption of zero canopy resistance, particularly in, in areas that have extended dry periods, material can accumulate on leaf surfaces and other surfaces and potentially create a non-zero canopy resistance that challenges our, our current thinking of nitric acid deposition in our model frameworks. And then as we will get into more a little bit later, Nitric acid fluxes can be influenced by gas particle interconversion of the ammonium nitrate system. And, and that's a process that we need to better understand. And it's a process that's uh, evident in some of our, our flux measurement data sets. So sticking with oxidized inorganic nitrogen, but moving on to NO2, um, our budget suggests it can account for five or six percent of the total dry deposition at the continental scale. Six studies available in the literature, all of them employ eddy covariance techniques to quantify the flux. Measurements have been conducted over grassland and, and forest ecosystems. Um, but thinking back to uh, Pam and Greg's presentations where they, they highlighted these urban to rural gradients in deposition, and Pam specifically talked about relationships between oxidized nitrogen deposition and NOx emissions. I'm showing you on the right hand side a couple of, of graphics from a study by Carol et al. showing satellite NO2 concentrations and then their estimates of inferential dry deposition of NO2. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you could zoom in, you would see these urban areas and urban to rural gradients as hot spots for NO2 concentrations and, and inferred dry deposition. And we really don't have measurements in these urban to rural gradients where these dry deposition for NO rates for NO2 could be quite a bit higher. And we need more data there to assess the dry deposition budget and to evaluate models for NO2 dry deposition and concentration. And then here's the point that I'll come back to later. These studies that are available show both upward and downward fluxes of NO2 above natural ecosystems. And this challenges the fundamental model framework employed in, in regional chemical transport models, which is that for oxidized forms of nitrogen, trace gases and particles only deposit from the atmosphere to the surface. And we'll come back to this point later. So sticking with inorganic nitrogen, but moving to nitrate aerosol. Now we're in the, the aerosol phase. Our budget suggests that nitrate could account for nine or 10% of dry deposition at the continental scale. There are five studies dating back to 1988 where nitrate fluxes have been measured directly and most of them with the gradient method using filter packs. But more recently, aerosol mass spectrometers have been used to quantify fluxes by eddy covariance. There are measurements in grassland ecosystems, a couple of forest studies, and even alpine tundra at Niwot Ridge. But a couple of things that stand out in the literature regarding nitrate fluxes. In these data sets, there's evidence of gas to particle interconversion of the ammonium nitrate system, and that affects our interpretation of the, of the flux. Uh, 
I'm, I'm showing you an illustration on the right hand side, which is an example of what happens when ammonium nitrate particles are depositing to a warm surface. If you look at the, the species that I have across the top there, ammonium nitrate aerosol, ammonia, and nitric acid. And you can imagine a nitrate, an ammonium nitrate particle that's depositing to a surface, that surface is warm, and so as the particle gets closer and closer, it begins to evaporate. And as it evaporates, it liberates ammonia and nitric acid to the gas phase. So this process can affect the gradients of these compounds above the surface. The ammonium nitrate gradient would decrease rapidly from the atmosphere to the surface, and it would impose uh, counter gradients of ammonia and nitric acid higher at the surface and decreasing toward the atmosphere. So if you were quantifying the flux of ammonium nitrate using a gradient method, you would see that nitrate is depositing faster than you would expect allowable type by turbulence alone. And you would infer these gradients of ammonia and nitric acid as emissions to the atmosphere. And for nitric acid, that's, that's, um, that's not realistic. And so these, these chemical processes can introduce some features to our flux data sets that really make it difficult to interpret the fluxes, which we assume reflect exchange with the surface itself. And in many cases, that's not the case. And we see these processes reflected in some of the available flux data sets. So future work should include not just the flux measurements of nitrate, but also concentrations at least of nitric acid and ammonia so we can determine the potential influence of these uh, gas particle um, interactions on the flux measurements. And then thinking about geographical gaps, coastal areas where coarse nitrate may make a, a larger contribution to the budget than we think are important geographical gaps where we need more nitrate flux measurements. So moving on, we'll talk briefly about reduced forms of inorganic nitrogen and we'll focus on ammonia, uh, which from our budget is, is again important, accounting for a little over 30% of dry deposition at the continental scale. Remember that ammonia is different from other compounds in that it can be exchanged bidirectionally with the surface depending on the ammonium concentration and the acidity of wet surfaces on, on leaves or the internal apoplast within the leaf itself or the soil pore water or moisture on the leaf litter. These biogeochemical ge pools of acidity and ammonium affect the bidirectional exchange of ammonia. So ammonia can be emitted from natural vegetation and soils or it can deposit to natural vegetation and soils. And so our flux measurements need to resolve these processes so that we can then um, simulate these processes in our models. Uh, eight studies of ammonia air surface exchange, some dating back to the late 80s, um, most using gradient methods, but more recently chemical ionization mass spec and open path and closed path quantum cascade laser systems are being employed to measure fluxes by eddy covariance, which is a real step forward for, for ammonia. And then the REA technique has been used as well. So we have flux measurements, at least in terms of natural ecosystems over grasslands, alpine tundra at Niwot Ridge in Colorado, and a couple of deciduous forests. Uh, Bidirectional fluxes are observed in these data sets, so both emission and deposition, depending on time of day and time of year. Interestingly, there are no studies of fluxes in coniferous forests, and we don't have data sets of fluxes in agricultural regions where ammonia concentrations are high. We need to understand not only the dry deposition rates there, but also the, the processes, the feedback between dry deposition and the biogeochemistry that's driving the air surface exchange. So in terms of processes, we need more data to improve uh, parameterizations for emission potentials and compensation points for American, North American ecosystems. A lot of our parameterizations depend on European experiments. Just as a general statement, we need to incorporate biogeochemistry into our flux study so that we can interpret the bidirectional fluxes and translate this information into models. And we'll come back to this point, but we need to better understand the role of surface wetness and leaf cuticle chemistry in bidirectional exchange. I do want to point out um, that there are some new data sets just right around the corner for ammonia air surface exchange from Rocky Mountain National Park, Duke Forest, 
and some work that NOAA has conducted in up in Delaware in a in a, um, a marsh environment. So more data right around the corner for ammonia fluxes. So let's shift gears and talk about organic forms of nitrogen, and we'll we'll specifically talk about peroxynitrates. These are gas phase organic nitrogen compounds. They account for about five or six percent of nitrogen dry deposition at the continental scale. I'm I'm focusing on them because they're the most widely studied of the organic nitrogen fluxes. Uh, we found five studies in the literature for North America, including total peroxynitrate fluxes and, and speciated fluxes. Uh, typically, these fluxes are measured by eddy covariance using laser-induced fluorescence or chemical ionization mass spec. We, while we have five studies, we only have a couple of locations, the grassland site in Illinois and then a couple of forest sites, and there's been, been numerous studies at Blodgett Forest in California. Like NO2, an important feature of these data sets is that they show both upward and downward fluxes of peroxynitrates. This is specifically at Blodgett Forest in California. No studies over deciduous forests, interestingly, only coniferous forests. And these studies also highlight the importance of non-stomatal exchange pathways, that is, exchange with the leaf cuticle or the exterior surface of the leaves or the ground. Um, so we see that those processes are important for peroxynitrate in the, in the available data. So that's a quick snapshot of, of what we see in the literature with respect to specific compounds, where and when data are available, and some basic features of the, of the data sets. But now I want to turn to what the review uh, tells us or, or reinforced in terms of conclusions and future research that is needed. And I've broken them down into some different categories here. First of all, in terms of completeness of the, of the deposition budget, are we, are we measuring all of the important forms of reactive nitrogen? Well, the answer is no, but there are some things that we can do about it. And in some cases, they would be fairly easy to do. We mentioned, I mentioned bulk flux measurement methods earlier. There are techniques available using fast chemiluminescence and high temperature converters that will allow us to measure the total NOI flux and even the total reactive nitrogen flux by eddy covariance. And so while these measurements wouldn't be uh, real useful for examining processes because they're, they're combining all of the, all of the um, species together to measure a net flux, they would be very useful for measuring, for quantifying seasonal and annual dry deposition budgets. And so one thing we could do is employ these techniques in North America to improve budgets. Uh, we could also use these techniques for total peroxy and alkyl nitrate fluxes, though some work would need to be done there. So one thing we can do is, is apply more widely some of the available techniques that have been used in Europe. Studies of speciated organic nitrogen are still lacking, as we've seen. Um, but there again, there are methods available that, for example, mass spectrometer methods that have been used for concentrations of amine species that we could potentially um, employ for flux measurement. So we can do more with available techniques in terms of the completeness of the budget. In terms of temporal and geographical variability of fluxes, we, we really need some long-term flux measurement sites. A feature of the data that are available is that the experiments for cost reasons, logistics, a number of things, dry deposition measurements are difficult or, and expensive. They don't cover very long periods of time. The Harvard Forest measurements conducted by, um, at, Har at Harvard Forest are, are the only example of multi-year long-term flux measurements of reactive nitrogen. So we need, we need some long-term flux measurement sites. And we need, so we can do, we could do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we could follow kind of the Nitro Europe uh, plan, which is to have a handful of process level measurement sites in select ecosystems and, and atmospheric chemistry regimes where there aren't a lot of these sites, but at those sites where we're making continuous speciated measurements of the most important compounds to not only develop budgets, but also examine air surface exchange processes. But then potentially deploying lower cost dry deposition systems at a larger number of sites to develop seasonal and annual deposition budgets or to, tar to target the most important parts of the dry deposition budget. So 
we need long-term measurement sites, but we don't necessarily need a hundred very expensive sites. We could do this with a combination of, of expensive sites and lower cost sites. And, and there's a model for this that, um, that's been um, illustrated in Europe by the Nitro Europe project. We also need more studies of oxidized nitrogen in deciduous forests and ammonia in coniferous forests. In terms of geographical gaps, the literature just kind of re-emphasizes some things that we knew already, but I'll, I'll highlight them again here. High elevation and alpine environments, we only found two studies of direct flux measurements, both at Niwot Ridge. So we need more direct flux measurements in these environments, but we're going to have to adapt micrometeorological flux measurement techniques to complex terrain to really, to really get at some of these questions. Urban to rural gradients, we saw earlier how important these environments are in terms of deposition and deposition hotspots. These are areas where we need more measurements of NO2, HONO, and NOI fluxes. Agricultural regions are areas where we need measurements of ammonia bidirectional exchange and total nitrogen dry deposition. Amines are likely to be import more important in agricultural areas than in other areas, potentially. I mentioned coastal zones as a geographic gap for coarse nitrate and organic nitrogen. And then to reiterate the importance of measurements in arid regions where dry deposition dominates, we need measurements there. And, and there we need to better understand exchange with bare soil, which has not been a focus of our, of our models up until now. So I'll give you two more examples to wrap up here. These are, these are knowledge gaps from a process standpoint. As I mentioned earlier, observations of oxidized nitrogen fluxes show both upward and downward fluxes above forest ecosystems. And this really challenges the deposition framework that's used in chemical transport models, which is that oxidized nitrogen deposits from the atmosphere to the surface. Now, uh, as we mentioned, ammonia is a little bit different in that it's exchanged bidirectionally, but that's driven by biogeochemistry. The work of the work at, at Blodgett Forest um, that's been done over the years really illustrates that for oxidized nitrogen, in canopy chemical production can be important in determining the magnitude and the direction of oxidized nitrogen fluxes. And so what I'm showing you here is a schematic of NOx cycling within the Blodgett Forest ecosystem. So NOx that advects into the ecosystem or nitric oxide that's emitted from the soils is cycled within the canopy to produce peroxynitrates and alkyl nitrates that are subsequently emitted to the atmosphere. So this is an example where, where the chemistry within the canopy airspace and near the canopy is influencing the magnitude and the direction of the flux. And so we need more more studies in different environments to see how important in canopy chemistry is and to begin to simulate some of these processes in chemical transport models. Now that's, a, that's obviously a big challenge because the computational intensity of, of introducing chemistry into the air surface exchange process. But the data sets that are available, not only in the United States but elsewhere, are showing us that we need to advance the models in that direction because we're seeing bidirectional exchange of not just ammonia, but oxidized nitrogen as well. And then finally, I'll come to um, come back to non-stomatal exchange processes. We mentioned this earlier. These are processes of air surface exchange uh, with the leaf surface or the ground, for example. And some of our data sets are, are showing us the importance of surface wetness in, in governing bidirectional exchange. And I'll show you a quick example on the right-hand side here. This is some work done in Rocky Mountain National Park by Greg Wentworth and, and colleagues. And I'm showing you from his paper a couple of time series here of ammonia concentrations in air just above a grass field on mornings after, uh, on mornings after nights with and without dew formation. And if you look at the left-hand plot there, this is a time series from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m of ammonia concentration in air for nights where there was dew formation. And what you see is that after the sun comes up and the surface begins to dry, concentration of ammonia in the air goes up, in some cases quite rapidly. And if you look at nights without dew on the right-hand side, you don't see this process. And so while they weren't making flux measurements, 
they interpret these measurements to mean that ammonia that's deposited overnight to the wet surface is re-emitted in the morning as the surface dries out. We do see this process in some of our in some of our flux measurement data sets, but this just reinforces the the importance of that process, which we need additional measurements to really quantify to see if this happens in in all ecosystems and is a general feature of wet surfaces, or if it if it's more um, complex than that. In terms of resolving non-stomatal exchange processes, I come back to the need for long-term data sets. And we need long-term data sets to develop um, nighttime flux data sets. During the day, the stomatal openings on, on leaves are, are active, they're open, and that exchange pathway is important. But we assume at night that the non-stomatal component of the exchange shuts down. And so we interpret our flux measurements to be reflective of air service exchange via non-stomatal processes with wet surfaces and into the ground. But night periods are challenging for micrometeorological measurements because often turbulence is not well developed or it's intermittent. And so typically in our flux data sets, we have to eliminate a lot of nighttime data. And so if you're only collecting measurements for two or three weeks and you're throwing out a lot of that nighttime data, you end up with very little data to really try to examine these non stomatal processes. And that's another reason we need long-term flux data sets. We also need data sets that that separate the canopy scale flux from the flux to the ground. And so those are some areas of need in terms of better understanding non stomatal processes. So there are a number of other examples that we could have gone into today. I just wanted to give you kind of an overview. There's much more detail in our paper that was recently published in Science, The Total Environment. And this paper includes references for all of the studies that I, that I mentioned today. And so I'll, I'll direct you there for more information. Um, this is my contact information if you wanna reach out to me for uh, additional information. And I'll end with the, the EPA disclaimer. And maybe we have time for a few questions. Yes, we have time for questions. So now everybody is really excited about flux measurements. I think everybody's scared. <laughs> I have a question. This is Ted Porwall in Pinedale. Hi, Ted. Um, yeah, you were talking about surface wetness and soil moisture and those type of things, and then uh, the fact that you just have, uh, you know, need more measurements in arid areas. I'm wondering um, if there's anything in your paper that talked about uh, fluxes in the snowpack or at the surface of the snowpack? That, that's a really good question. And, and there are a number of, well, so with respect to nitrogen, we found one study specifically um, over snow and it was for N2O5, which is really um, a species that, that hasn't been studied very extensively in terms of fluxes. So this study was unique in that it targeted that compound and it was over snow. And what they saw in that particular study is that the N2O5 deposited very rapidly. It behaved like nitric acid. It, it will do that over other natural surfaces just given its, its solubility. But um, that's one particular paper in, in which snow was a focus. Um, but we point out in a couple of different places in the white paper the need for direct flux measurements over snowpack so that we can improve our, our models of air surface exchange for snow covered surfaces. So that is really an important need that I didn't didn't mention. Um, another question kind of um, attached to that, I guess, is uh, how about uh, within the snowpack where you have, uh, you know, water vapor, you have uh, water at the triple point and you have a constant uh, temperature flux and kind of a phase changes going on constantly. Is that something that's been looked at? I, I believe that has been looked at. Um, I, I don't know so much from the aspect of interpreting those processes with air service exchange measurements for reactive nitrogen, but I know some of those processes have been, been looked at for other compounds, uh, particularly in Europe and elsewhere. But that, 
you know, we 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 struggle with getting understanding the processes, of the leaves and soil, much less the complexities of of right. snow and and at different depths within snow. But it is it is important because um, dry deposition to these snow covered surfaces, and then what happens with the nitrogen when it's dry deposited is really uh, important and we, we don't have a lot of measurements to go on there from the air surface exchange side. Um, one more question and it's kind of a basic one I guess. Uh, is, is there a possibility that some of these compounds are actually being banked in the snowpack from dry depth and then volatilized and re-volatilized um, you know as uh, the energy input kind of increases? Yeah, there are there may be some other folks on the call that could speak to the the storage of the compounds in snowpack, but that certainly does happen as you you get dry deposition and then the snow accumulates and so those nitrogen compounds are being stored and so they're they're entering the ecosystem when the snow melts. When it melts though, you're right. I think there's the potential for some of those compounds to be re-emitted back into the into the atmosphere. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Any other questions for John? John, this is Jim Renfro. Quick quick question on the dew and ammonia. That uh, yeah. that 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 daytime burst uh, mm -hmm. of tripling and four to six ppb. How, what explains the concentration increase? Is it a Previ does previous day help explain that or uh, current ambient mixing or I mean it's coming off the soil off the plant yeah what's wh you have an explanation of that increase the, source yeah the idea is that that reflects the loss of ammonia that has accumulated in the dew overnight so um, ammonia or, or the previous day. So ammonia that's deposited, that is in that dew, which is a temporary reservoir for the ammonia, the next morning when the surface dries out, that ammonia gets re-emitted back into the atmosphere. It'd be neat to see that over the full time scale of dew, no dew as it goes through a season. It would, and it would be, uh, this is a really interesting study, and we learned a, a lot about the, this process and the and the sort of the processes that are that are driving um, the loss of ammonia or from wet surfaces. But I, we need we need actual flux measurements in in other ecosystems. These are concentrations measurements, and and they're certainly useful. But we need to resolve this process in terms of fluxes. And I agree with you. We need to do it for extended periods of time so we can understand the importance of this process within the context of, of longer term estimates of, of net fluxes. We do see, if you look at the ammonia literature, you do see this feature in air concentrations in different locations. In the morning, you see this increase in ammonia. Um, depending on where you are uh, and other local sources, it can you can see a morning peak that then declines through the afternoon or you can see a bimodal peak with a with one being in the morning. So this this morning increase in ammonia is is observed in many other data sets of atmospheric concentrations. But Greg Wentworth and and his colleagues were able to look at it uh, more closely in terms of measuring the content of ammonium in the dew, performing some mass balance calculations to see, okay, if we have this much here, how much would we expect to be lost given the other chemistry of the dew? They really looked at it from a process standpoint, but you, you see this behavior of ammonia at other sites. Interesting, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? I don't know if it's routine to clap for your present presenters on a webinar, but I feel like we should. Thank you. Thank you um, to all of our presenters today. Um, our next
seminar will be on Wednesday, October 16th. Um, again, we have Mike Bell talking about the science needs of through fall and Selma Issel talking about the science needs of occult deposition. Um, I will mention that we are going to ask um, folks to register for the next seminar, and that is just basically so that we can have a working list of folks um, that are calling in and that are interested. Um, and if there's no other questions or comments, we will sign off for the day. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next month. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.